I just want to tell you that I have a great um, admiration for what you do. I love the ocean. I was born on Cape Cod, um, have been around the water all of my life, um, and, and, and I really, truly understand the difficult situations that you people are in, especially when it comes to raising money. And Blake will address more of that this afternoon. But the key to making money work in your behalf is having an effective board. If you have board members that are there to have it on their resume, you're wasting your time. If you have board members who are not as passionate as you are about your mission, you're wasting time. In Houston, and I can only talk to that market, if you go to one of the philanthropic resources, the first thing they're going to say to you, is your board participating financially 100%? 100%. Are they all given out of their own pocket? Number two, do you have a strategic plan? And number three, show me how it's being implemented. So all of those three functions are primary functions of the board. Look at this. And out of this, you will get a wonderful board description. I have a board description in the packet also. And our board contract requires that board members make an annual contribution out of their own pocket. And that, 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 changes, the, that changes the ball game a lot because they have skin in the game. So we want to talk about board roles, a board assessment, Defining diversity, the positive and negatives of diversity, diversity matters, and making your board all inclusive. And that is so important. Many board members are affluent people who come to you um, via an introduction from one of the other board members, and somebody says, Well, I got Mark Niles, he's a good guy, put him on the board. Well, can you get can you get money? Um, if you look at the responsibilities of nonprofits, they're becoming increasingly larger. Organizations expect you, as nonprofits, to exercise best business practices. The pool of monies is shrinking way down. The number of horses at the pool is increasing exponentially. So that you know that you're going to have to go to the private, private philanthropic market. The monies, build it and they will come. Those days are gone, absolutely gone. Whether you're in a ministry, whether you're in a charter school, whether you're in your human services, it doesn't make any differences. So the strategic plan of the organization outlines these kinds of things. And in your strategic plan, if you plan to do a capital campaign, that needs to be in your strategic plan, a board member responsibility. So I'm talking about some things maybe coming in the back door, but these are all board member responsibilities. The board sets the course of the organization. The executive director and the staff, or the executive director drives the bus, and the staff implements whatever needs to be done to get you where you want to go. But it's the board's responsibility. It's not the executive director's responsibility to, to create a state plan. It's not their responsibility to implement it. It's the board. So <clears throat> when you look at um, who will make a difference on your board, and, and, and lots of people say, well, I've got black people on there, I've got Hispanic people, I've got Caucasian people on there. That, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what we need. We need diversity of thought. You need diversity of ideas. Blake and I are working on a current contract right now where all of the board members of all of the same culture, six of the 13 board members are term limited and they haven't done anything about it and they're stuck. And they don't understand why they're stuck. They're stuck because there's, there's no diversity of thought. The board members fill every committee. So if 
the four or five of us are sitting on the committee and we've been together five or six years. I know how you're going to vote. You know what I'm going to say. I know how you're going to go. What? So there's no, it's, it just let's follow the, you know, the, the uh, path of least resistance. And, and consequently, they're stuck. So I'm not sure what their plan is. We have a plan, uh, but I'm not sure what they intend to do about it. But diversity is an incredible consideration with the board. Um, is your board member familiar with your strategic plan? So when we talk about recruiting board members, we have a process. But one of the, excuse me, one of the things that we request and require that they do is to read the strategic plan and understand it. And ask questions about it. The second thing that they, or the most important question that you may ask of a prospective board member is, what do you think of our implementation? Because what got us into this business was, I mean, I came out of organization development, and I would see a beautiful leather binder on a bookcase covered with dust. I said, what's that? Well, that's our strategic plan. Really? Good for you. How much does that cost you? I, I think we paid the consultants about $100,000. Really? And what have you guys done about it? Well, we talk about it. Currently, Blake and I are working with a, this client now. They have a strategic plan. What have you guys done? Nothing. We haven't done anything. It's a five-year strategic plan, which means it was done in 2009. What does that mean? It means, you know, we haven't really had any changes since 2009. And the market has changed. The demands have changed. Their stakeholders' needs have changed. So to get a strategic plan is one thing, and to follow the perspective set in the strategic plan is quite something else. What's, what's the current needs of your board? I, the, there's an assessment interest in, instrument in the handouts. What are the needs? I have an attorney that spoke this morning does your board have an attorney on it? Does your board have a financial person? Does your board have a retired mariner? A re retired pilot? A retired ship captain? Those are the kinds of perspectives that you need. Does your board have someone from the city who understands the port and the port needs? Sharon was really helped by a woman in, who had an HR job at one of the port industries really helped. And so you gather those resources and then you can maximize and you can leverage those into some really incredible results. But you have to listen to what your board needs are. You have to look at it. You have to be honest. Well, I've got Sharon on my board and she's a wonderful person and she and I have been friends for 15 years, plus the fact she's a good cook. Um, I, I would feel bad about letting her go. Well, don't let her go. Put her on an advisory committee. If you have a board without term limits, you're harnessing yourself. You, you're, you're constricting the creativity of the board ideas. So you say to an older board member, it's time for you to move on. Put an advisory capacity and set up an advisory board. Let them stay there for a year, and then let them be real or eligible for renomination. You don't want to lose the collective wisdom, so it's a very important to look at the current needs of the board. And if you've got somebody that is redundant, then put that person, if you can, into a advisory position. We have a board member application. It will be in the information that you'll receive. Follow the guidelines set up there. They're, they're there for a reason. The most important committee, the most important committee on a board of directors is the nominating committee. They control what the board looks like. And what the board looks like translates into what your agency will look like, what your center will look like. If you've got a passive sleeping board, guess what? And that's not what you need. So 
So you have to truly look at that. Our, our process is if Sharon nominated um, Ron and she said, well, I'd like to have Ron on the board, the first thing that I, we would do is ask the executive director and one of the other board members to go visit with him. What's your interest? Where's your passion? Well, you know, I need to do some public service. You know, you'd be sound asleep. Come on. No, I like what you do. I think I can help. Okay, we'd like you to come to a board meeting. Excuse <coughs> me. Invite that person to one or two board meetings. Let them see what the operation looks like. Give that person a copy of your strategic plan. Give that person the copy of your board member contract that states that you will make an annual contribution of. And, and a lot of time that winnows down the playing field. Oh, no, I can't do that. If you find someone that you think can make a contribution but may not be able to do the financial contribution, figure out what that contribution is. They may be able to get in-kind services that you would have to pay for otherwise. They may know people who can give money. And I hate to be, you know, sitting up here sounding like a, a televangelist, but that's what you got to do. you got to raise money. I mean, it's that simple. And as I said, the, the, the pool of, of uh, governmental resources is shrinking, and the number of horses showing up to the pool is more. So you have to, we have, you have to move forward. So cultural, racial, that's all. Good. Ideological representation of the community is extremely important. Extremely important. In, in the ship channel industries that I'm aware of, I mean, they're pretty active, very active in all kinds of things in Houston. So um, we talked about that. Everybody was talking about collaboration. Find people who are in co have a possibility of collaboration with your Senate. Bring one of their board members on. Um, now there's some risk to trying to establish a diverse board, and one is conflict. There may be some conflict. There may be cultural conflict. There may be commercial conflict. There may be personal conflicts. Um, so you have to weigh that. Uh, you have to make some judicious decisions. If you have only successful businessmen, will he or she be able to communicate with a retired seaman? That's something you have to think about. You want both on the board, but who can be the most effective communicator would be the, would be the uh, deciding factor. Um, well, I don't want to do this. We've never done it over where we are. Well, I want to do it now. So you, you're going to face some conflict as opposed to where, board, where Blake and I are working now, where they all know each other. It's all, it is incestuous almost, the thoughts are. They know before they bring an issue forward for, at a board meeting, what's going to happen? Because <coughs> they can count the votes. So it may take you a little bit longer. And if, if you bring a retired seaman in, is he going or she going to feel exploited or, or discounted because everybody else shows up in a brand new car? So these are considerations, but you want to be able to diversify your board. Um, the other thing that you have to do, and, and, and this, the, the loss of focus is dramatic, but what you do is you keep refocusing the board's focus with your strategic plan. Every month, every quarter, what's going on? We were going to build a new facility. Where are we money-wise? Where are we plan-wise? Where are we architecturally-wise? Have we got the city permits? Whatever it is, it doesn't make any difference. But that's how you keep the focus going. So it doesn't make any difference that some people have uh, going to go play golf afterwards and somebody else is going to go fish afterwards. It doesn't make any difference. The purpose of the meeting is to set direction for your center. That is the purpose of your board. Anything else is redundant. It's 
superfluous. Get rid of it. And Blake will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and if you look at our brochure, you'll see the diagram. This is what we do. This, everything we do is based upon this diagram. Looking at today, what is your vision out five years from now? What's your mission? Your mission is why you exist. But from today to where you want to go is your strategy. And the board's responsible to set that strategy. Excuse me. And so this is, I mean, this is as simple as you can get. And, 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 and it's very, very effective. So when you're in a board meeting and something comes up, somebody needs to say, is this supporting the strategy? Is this helping us reach our vision? Or is this redundant? Or is this a waste of time? And the upside, obviously, there's a lot of upsides. The, the greatest upside is the untapped resources. Let me tell you about a capital campaign that we did down in Fort Bend County. Um, the executive directors, they were kind of like almost in a semi-residential area. And the executive director and all the administrators' offices were there. We did a $2 million campaign. We did 22.3 in 22 months. And um, I was sitting with the executive director, and we were going through something else. And there was a knock on the door, and the administrative assistant came in, and she said, Christy, there's a woman here to see you. And she lives across the street. And Christy thought it was you know, a complaint about parking or something. And this woman came in. I was sitting there. And she said, uh, my name is, and she told Christy her name. She said, I understand that you people are raising money. And Christy said, yes, ma'am. She said, no one came to speak with me. Christy said, well, I'm really sorry. She said, you know, raising money is hard enough, but to overlook a possible gift is, is, is unforgivable. The woman sat at Christy's desk and wrote a check for $25,000, period. So when you look at untapped resources, those are the kinds of things that you want to think about. Those are the kinds of things you can say, who can bring that segment of the population or the, that segment of donor prospects to our board? Who can bring that segment of consideration, legal considerations, financial considerations, human resource considerations? Who can bring those to our board? So when you're looking at building a dynamic board, those are the considerations that you must take into consideration. Higher levels of performance. If you have a board that has been together for six years, I can guarantee you the first thing they want to do is eat, the second thing they want to do is argue, and the third thing they want to do is talk about their families. You know? And that doesn't do much for your center. So those are things that you have to look at. Those are the things that you need to understand. Um, when you have a diverse board, when you come up with a special consideration, something that's just out of the ordinary, you'll probably find the answer if you have a diverse board within your board structure. Um, everything's relative, or relevant, excuse me. I think that the one thing that you have to realize as a group of people, and most executive directors or CEOs or whatever, they sit as a non-voting member of most of the nonprofit boards. So you have to realize, what is it that we're looking for? What have we got? And note the diversity, and then work through it, and capitalize on what you have. We've got to go outside. We've got to hire a consultant. We are overrun with conversation that if the board were focused on the mission and the vision, it wouldn't be necessary. 
Guarantee it. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. So I think that in, in light of what we do, I think that if, we, if you can have one takeaway, you can have all the downloads, my information's there, Blake's information's gonna be there. Also, don't hesitate to call or email us. But if you have one takeaway, one takeaway is the importance of building a passionate, engaged board. Don't let it, do not let that go. Um, commit to change. If you haven't got it going now, when you walk out of this room, say, we need to get it together. We need to change. I need to bring new board members on. Ask each of your current board members to bring two prospective names to the table in the next six months. So if you've got six, you'll have 12 board prospects, hopefully. Investigate them. Out of the 12, three or four may work. Don't notify them. Don't tell your board member to say, well, we want to consider you for board membership. Just, what would you think about serving? Well, I'll think about it. Bring that name forward. And if you've got term limited board members, you've got to enforce your term limits. Period. I know it's uncomfortable. I know they've made a great contribution. I know all of that. But it's old thought. This is the way we've always done it. Um, and as I said, I, I think diversity, the most important part of the diversity is new ideas, new thought. Wonderful to see middle age pretty successful board members and then have some young woman or man on the board for some reason has, has gotten taken an interest and all of a sudden, I mean social media is a brand new, uh, is a brand new deal and everybody's waking up to it. But there, if you want to get active in social media, get a young, get a young professional on your board. They tweet and twick and whatever they do. They do all kinds of things. Um, don't ask me, you know, do not ask me to help you with that. I, there's nothing I can do. Um, the other thing that you want to do as far as board activity goes is use ad hoc committees. If you've got a finance committee and um, there is a, we want to talk about uh, reinvestigate or reopen our consideration of where we're going to do our banking. You form an ad hoc committee, get somebody from outside the organization, off the board, and two or three people go do the work, then bring it to the board's attention. Ad hoc committee dissolves. So your standing committee's probably four. No? You need an executive committee who hires, fires, and looks after the uh, executive director, you need a finance committee, you need a nominating committee, and a program committee. Are there other committees that need to be standing in your case? Maybe so. But four is what we recommend, certainly to start with. Use ad hoc committees to fill other bills, temporary, temporary needs. Again, um, I, I may be preaching to the choir, but I don't think so. If your board is long term, they're term limited, they've sat together, where are you going to get your decision making? We have worked with organizations that are absolutely stuck, and we don't know. Bring in a consultant. Oh, we got screwed by the consultants. Why? How did it happen? Well, they gave us a whole bunch of things to do. Did you do them? No, but they screwed us with the bill. Oh, okay. You know, ser seriously, I mean, this is the kind of conversation that goes on. You know, the same guy sitting there with his strategic plan that cost their corporation fifty or $60,000 with dust on it. It's a nice binder. I am serious. Off at Levengers or one of the high-end places, but 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 think about that. Um, 
as we work with the philanthropic market in Houston, and, and, and the Gulf Coast of Texas is extremely generous. It is. It's a very generous part of the United States. But you, you can see the young um, second generation, maybe third, but second generation philanthropists are asking the same questions <coughs> as the corporations and the foundations. What's my ROI? What am I going to get in return? And if you have a gift from someone, do not think about going back and asking them for another gift until they know what you did with the previous gift. You gave us 25000 last year, and we bought a van. And the van hasn't cost us any money to run. Thank you so much. Give us 100 please. Um, yeah, I guess you could slip that in if you wanted to. But those are the kinds of things that if you get a donation, let me tell you something that's really funny. It isn't funny, but it is. Um, we were asked to bid on a project, met with the president, met with the development officer, and it was a big project. And um, something happened politically that was given to another company. We won the contract, but politically it was taken away. I get thank you letters for the donations that I've made. Well, you know, I haven't made any, so it may be a, a, a tad redundant. But if somebody sends you a check for 15 or 20 or 15, $25 or $100, thank them. Sit down, write them a little note, thank you so much. I think email is the second best, but I, you know, a handwritten note goes so much further. It, it, it just does. Um, and somebody on the board may be much better than that than other people. Um, you see people who are in marketing and sales positions, and, and they want them to do donor research. Come on. Let those people get out and talk about it. Let those people make presentations to the service groups in town. So those are the kinds of things that, that are really important. Nominating committee, we talked about that. Establish a nominating protocol and follow it. Blake would come and say, you know, i got this guy, Niles, who can really help us. You don't know me. Why would you even bother to put me on the board? Just because Blake said so. Well, you don't want that. Establish a protocol that we talked about earlier. Do a board assessment. Do we need that gifts? Do we need those gifts this person can bring? Yeah. Well, all right, it's a good candidate. No, we don't. Thank them. and then move on. But you establish a protocol and follow it. That's, that's basically. Identification, visit with the CEO, invite to a meeting, da 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 da. Don't let the person on the board if they're not willing to sign the board contract. It is not enforceable, you know, legally, but it sure tells them you're not fooling around either. Remember you said you would make nine meetings a year. Remember you said that three absences would constitute dismissal. Remember you said you would contribute $1,500 in a senior contract. So I can say to you, if you are concerned about the direction of your center, it's not about the economy, it's probably not about the industry, it's probably not about the community you're in. It's about your board. And in order to help you move forward, you need to reassess where your board people are today, where they are in regards to the strategic plan, and what they're willing to commit to change. And if you'll do those things when you leave here, I'm available by email to talk with you or commerce or food, uh, a uh, telephone call, but change it. Don't sit there and say, you know, this is the hand we would dealt. Oh, my soul. Isn't it awful? Uh-uh. Ain't going to work. I'll entertain questions.